So today for Gore's Question Time, I've got the pleasure of being joined by Nigel Toome from Graphcore. Hi, Nigel. Hi, how are you? Good to yeah, meet you. Yeah, very good. Very good, Nigel. Very good. Uh, we know each other through Creative Destruction Lab at Oxford University and helping out mentoring, both of us mentoring AI people at that. Yes, so it's indeed. Great to, it's great to have you here with, with me to talk about AI. So could you kick us off with an introduction to yourself and Graphcore first so we know some context about you? Yeah, so I guess um, once upon a time I was an engineer um, developing semiconductor products and helping customers use them, um, worked for a big uh, American, well, at the time I joined them, they were tiny, actually, American company that, that went public and grew to Fortune 500. I ended up running about a quarter of that company's business, you know, around the world, um, then built a business with three other co-founders that we grew and we sold for about half a billion helped the VCs on a couple of other companies. And then in 2016, we started um, Graphcore um, and got together with one of the co-founders from that previous company, where we're developing a new kind of microprocessor that accelerates artificial intelligence. So we've raised about $700 million, got about 500 people in the company selling products um, around the world. <clears throat> so in terms of this technology, we've heard about GPUs and nvidia and sort of stuff like that how do you distinguish yours yours to that sort of one that's all in the news at the moment yeah so very much competing head to head uh with nvidia uh, customers are desperately trying to find um an alternative and so if you think about a cpu that you would have in your laptop or your mobile phone that will be a processor that has one piece of data and one instruction so you have an instruction working on one piece of data um, in a GPU, you'll have one instruction and multiple pieces of data, uh, something called SIMD, single instruction, multiple data. In an IPU, we go a step further where we have multiple instructions working on multiple pieces of data, all in parallel. So much more like your brain, in fact, in terms of how that works. And that allows you to deal with the much more complex data structures um, that you find in these machine learning and AI deep learning applications. All right, great. So this computing power, which is going to keep the intelligence sort of moving ahead, really, you're building then. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it's it's been phenomenal, the rate of progress here. I guess the sort of breakthrough event happened around about 2012, uh, where there were a few different experiments um, where people started to realize how we could build uh, artificial intelligence systems using deep neural networks. We had enough data and enough computing power to make those work. Um, and we started to be able to build AI systems that would actually recognize objects in images and to do that better than both the conventional um, coding approaches using, you know, typically what we do with a computer is we tell it what to do step by step in a program. Mm -hmm. Whereas in AI, what you're really doing, it's a method that is learning from information um, to solve the problem itself. So, so you're describing the method that it will use to learn from the information. Um, and, and then that allows it to, for example, recognize uh, objects in images. Um, and so that was a bit of a breakthrough moment. And then since 2012, you know, you've seen massive um, evolutions with things like um, AlphaGo, where you know DeepMind beats the world's um, world champion Go player. Um, you know, maybe we didn't notice so much about that in Europe and the US, but in China, yeah. 240 million people watched that live um, on television. So that was like a Sputnik moment for yeah. the Chinese government. And then you had um, obviously ChatGPT uh, coming out at the um, end of 2022, early 23, which again was a bit sort of push AI really into the public consciousness. But we're just at the very beginning. We're just yeah, at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. So one of the reasons for prompting to have the discussion with you is you've written, re recently written a book and it's about to come out sort of uh, just in February now called How AI Works or How AI Thinks, sorry. So How AI I Thinks, yes, yes. Um, the, and yeah, no, so that's been a, it's been something I've worked on over the last couple of years. Um, obviously, I guess sitting in the seat that I do, I have a sort of a unique view in terms of not just what AI is today, 
but also working with many of the researchers um, across the industry, you know, seeing what's coming next and, and understanding really what's allowed us to actually make AI work at the level that it is currently um, working at. So c- could you give us the, the brief summary then of how AI works? You you touched on it there with neural <laughs> networks and all of that, but maybe take a little step back and, and give us that brief introduction for us mortals. You know, we use the internet and we use our mobile phones without knowing all the tech behind that. So can you say Yeah, and that, again, that's very much the stimulus for writing the book. Um, you know, lots of people, you know, saying to me, oh, you know, and I talk about, you know, what I do, and they say, oh, AI, hey, I'm not quite sure I trust that. I'm not quite sure I understand how it works. But we do we understand how our own brain works? Do we understand how we um, make decisions? You know, most of the decisions that we make, um, they're not a fully deductive process. We don't have all the information we need and all the logical steps to decide, you know, how to pick a partner that we're going to spend the rest of our life with, for example. Um, There's a lot of judgment um, that goes into that. Um, You know, you can write a program to operate the anti-lock brakes on a car, but very difficult to write a program that describes every logical step Um, to navigate it across a city like London, for example. But maybe what we can do is we can come up with a method where we can feed enough data and information into that system and let it learn how to drive the car and to solve other kinds of problems where there is no right or wrong answer necessarily, but we can come up with a probabilistic answer that helps us, um, you know, for example, understand how proteins might fold. Um, and so that's the big difference with, with AI is it's it's a probabilistic approach. And as Alan Turing says, you know, if you expect something to be um, intelligent, um, it's going to make mistakes, just as humans do. You know, to to err is human, um, but uh, it's really because we don't have all the information. And you know, that's the same with AI. Yeah, so it's just a different way of computing. Yeah, and I, and I th- I think some of this debate about or oh, is is AI or computers going to be better than humans or it's not going to be as good as humans we need to keep them in the loop i i i'm i'm getting a bit confused or a bit contrary to that that view now because they always seem to put the humans up there as the as the top and i and I, I i i do stupid things and i don't know answers to things and sort of stuff like that so you know are you comparing to me or are you comparing to alan turin or einstein or <laughs> so i have this difficulty in, in it's they, they think it ai is thinking in different ways and it's maybe computing thinking yeah. compared to biological thinking was one of the discussions at davos that i that i heard as well which i thought was quite interesting what's your view on that about how it well thinks? i think the first thing is we don't fully understand how the human brain works. You know, we have some clues and we have some some ideas and, you know, a lot of AI has been inspired by those biological processes. Um, And I try and cover some of those points in the book. But, you know, one of the things is we tend to overestimate that conscious thought process, you know, solving a cryptic crossword puzzle or, you know, understanding a Shakespearean sonnet and doing critical analysis um, Mm. on it. Um, whereas actually, you know, your brain is doing a huge amount of work, uh, subconsciously, you know, just to hit, imagine hitting a tennis ball, you know, this ball's coming towards you at 50 miles an hour over the, over the, um, down the court and you're lining up for the shot and you're trying to judge the bounce and the spin and where to stand and how to hit, you know, what strike to use to sort of send it back over the net, um, and win the point, you know, and you do all of that subconsciously um, because if you try and think about it, you're mm. going to be far too slow and you're going to miss the ball. And and it's interesting because there's research that was done at the University in Lucerne, the home of uh, Roger Federer, where they recognized that um, actually the amateur players have exactly the same reaction times as the professional players. And yet the professional players are just better at those judgments of how the ball flies how it you know how it's going to to um, bounce what strike to use um so it's not that their brain is working faster they're they're more intelligent at 
hitting a tennis ball. And so professional players can hit a tennis ball that's coming at them at over 100 miles now, you know, probably mm. twice your best um, amateur players. And certainly they're a lot better than me. Um, but, you know, it's that is all that is your brain doing that. And there's a huge amount of computation to do that. So so actually to Hans Morovic, who was a roboticist, um, came up with this uh, thing that's called the Morovic's paradox is that you you underestimate, you know, all of the things that you find very simple and they're really difficult to do in the computer. Um, but actually, it's much simpler to do things like, you know, playing checkers or, or um, chess. Um, for a computer, those logical processes that we find difficult are right. actually easier for the computer. But all the stuff that we find really difficult, and we just kind of put to one side as though oh, everybody can do that. Actually, that's really hard. Um, oh, for right. Okay, that's an interesting perspective. And so, it, are you optimistic for for AI potential in that then to do these things that we're not as good at, as and vice versa? Well, absolutely. So think of it like a piece of paper and a pencil. Um. You know, you rely on a piece of paper and a pencil to help you solve complicated problems. You know, you wouldn't solve a maths problem by trying to do it all in your head. You'll write it out um, on a piece of paper and you'll use that as a tool to expand um, your, your thinking. And so AI is a bit like that. You know, AI isn't replacing us. It is a tool that is augmenting our human intelligence. It's like a very powerful piece of paper and pencil that lets us solve problems that you know previously were out of reach. You know, thinking through all of the ways in which a protein could fold. Um, you know, AI started to make huge progress um, on that to map all of those different proteins and how they work. There's still more to do in terms of the actual full three-dimensional structures and how they would join together with molecules, but you know, we've made massive, massive progress um, on that. Um, and it's very similar to the approach that is used in AI for understanding language, because it's the sequence, you know, and in language, it's a sequence of words. Mm. And in a protein, it's the sequence of how these uh, long chain molecules um, combine together and unfold um, to create the different. But it's the same AI structures that we're using um, for, for both of those approaches, um, just as one simple example. Mm. Great, great. I'd, I'd like to take you on to the people aspect now. I, the book that I wrote a few years ago it was based around five Ps. So what's the purpose of what, what you're trying to do? What's the strategic objective? What's the right process to be able to do it? And, I, and I'm thinking now about AI implementations. The central P, though, to my five Ps is people, along with partners and then performance measures. So I, you know, for me, whenever you're doing a tech change, then you need to understand strategically why you're doing it. You need to work with partners. You need to get your objectives, but people is so central. So for you in GraphCore and for the changes in AI, what, what are you seeing about people change that we need to, to, to get right? Yeah, it's um, various research has been done on it. The, the idea that AI will improve the productivity of knowledge workers by four or five times. Um, which is the same kind of improvement that we saw in the Industrial Revolution with automation for weaving, um, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so that so the changes that that will make in terms of the impact it will have on people and the way they work, um, you know, some jobs, um, you know, will change quite dramatically. Um, there's a lot of studies being done, McKinsey as one example, that show that. Most jobs, though, cannot be fully automated. Partially, um, they can be automated. And so what that really means is, in some cases, that's really going to enhance people's work because it will take away that sort of drudgery. Um, you'll just be able to automate that away. In other cases, you know, it might change jobs, you know, in in more negative ways where, you know, people were being paid well for things that can now be automated. And so the impact on that really is around education. And I think AI changes the way you need to think about education um, dramatically as well. You know, the, the idea of rote learning, the three R's, you know, I'm, I'm dyslexic. I always struggle with three R's because two of the letters don't seem, <laughs> two of the words don't seem to start yeah. with an R. Um, but what we need to move towards is the three C's. Um, this idea of curiosity, 
um, uh, creativity and critical thinking. Um, and that's really what education needs to be focused on. And, and if you do that right, and, and AI can help people learn at their own speed, um, allow people who maybe are learning new skills, who don't want to go back into a classroom, you know, us older people, sorry to put you in the same camp. Yeah, yeah, I'll stay um, there. <laughs> you don't necessarily want to show yourself up you know, in a classroom with other people that you don't understand something, but you know, going online and you know learning a new skill you know in an interactive way with with an ai driven teaching process and then maybe getting some help from a tutor for one on one learning um you know this is the way that education uh, yeah, is going to change yeah, and it's they, amazing you know i spent a lot of time in china and you know, it's probably one of the things i've noticed how china is really adopting ai as part of their educational process you know children when they first go to school are sitting down with a an image detection system driven by AI that is helping them understand how to write the complicated um, Chinese characters and, yeah. and encouraging them and helping them um, to do that and showing them when they're getting it wrong. So, you know, they've really adopted it. And, you know, it's something that we need to think you know, really carefully about, I think. Definitely. I've, I've spent quite a bit of time in China and working and personally traveling and that as well. And I had a meeting with the head of my daughter's secondary school, my daughter's in sixth form. And we were having a discussion about AI and I gave her a copy of Kai Fu Lee's 2041 book because mm -hmm. the structure of that, it's got 10 chapters, science fiction part, the first chapter, the first part of the chapter, and then his AI venture investing sort of expertise. Yeah. And there's a very good chapter in there, one of them on education, about yeah. how personalized tutors and sort of stuff like that as well. And it's and it was a good discussion with the head of my daughter's school. And, and fair dues to them. They are there saying, yep, we're trying this. We're changing our classroom structures. We're, we're engaging yeah. with, the, with the students. They use it. You've got, to change the, you've got to change the exam structures as well. You know, what are we actually testing um, yeah. people on? Um, you know, is passing an exam where you, you regurgitate a bunch of information that you've tried to store is that useful you know how how long do you then retain that after passing yeah, the yeah. exam unless you're actually applying it yeah. so is it better to learn how to learn rather than actually learning some stuff that you then forget definitely yeah, yeah. so with my daughter and showing her well she i sort of come home excited sometimes say, oh look at this thing i've sort of seen she's like, oh dad i'm already doing that on tiktok or i'm already doing that on, <laughs> on this other area but in terms of using ai for her her education and all that i'm finding she's now engaging with it reading a lot more because it's in a better structure and and it's useful sort of area but also she made that she made quite an inter, uh, a good point to me said but that i need to know enough about it to ask the right questions and to know that it's going right. in the right direction actually i think there's it so i don't which I, is the critical I, thinking part of it isn't it that's definitely, the, definitely. the critical thinking piece which becomes even more important you know i think the idea of arts and humanities you know in an age of ai become even more important subjects um then you know necessarily even you know stem obviously is very important too but you know we need to remember where we come from um, and also, you know, it's this, again, I think maybe having some dyslexia sort of helps you realize that we all have neural diversity. Everybody's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we need to look at the world, not through other people's eyes, because we'll see the same thing, but it's actually through their brains. How do they interpret it? You know, what's their cultural sensitivities? You know, have they grown up in an Abrahamic religious environment or a Confucius religious environment? Maybe they have a different view about... Um, you know, how they they think about uh, authoritarian uh, leadership. You know, exactly. As a result uh, yeah, of so those that, cultural changes, yeah. Yeah, so that, that, that takes us, I guess, onto the ethics and bias sort of type perspective. Again, in this discussion about biases, I'm often pushing back at people and saying, oh, this system is biased. But I said, well, but from whose perspective? Because, you know, sometimes these biases are saying, oh, but it's not, it's not diverse or it's not egalitarian or it's not got a democratic sort of system. And I'm going, well, that's your view of where it's biased, but somebody else might be different. So what's your view on the ethics and bias questions that come up about AI? I was in a, I was at a conference um, speaking with Gary Kasparov um, and he made the point, which, you know, really, I think nailed it. The systems aren't bias. It's the data, it's the information. Um, that's bias. Um, and so what do we train these AI systems with? You know, if you go, if you were to judge 
um, intelligence on the basis of Nobel Prize winners, for example, you'd conclude that they're all rather elderly white males. You know, very few women have won Nobel Prizes. No black people have won Nobel Prizes. You know, it's it's shocking, really, that, you know, and the risk is that we'll just, you know, push those biases into AI systems and, and sustain them um, and reinforce them if we're not careful. So can you use AI to actually in, look at the data and actually work out, you know, is this um, inclusive um, drugs? You know, often uh, drugs are tested on willing people who step forward, which often are students. Um, so we miss elderly people. You know, often we miss people of color in the way that we test. And, you know, drugs are typically tested on men rather than women and they might have different reactions um, mm -hmm. to those drugs. And, and so are we being inclusive? And AI could potentially help us in that. So I, I in the book, I describe a sort of a simple framework that you know we can use to analyze some of these things, which I call AMP, which is basically, are we aware that AI is being used is the first point. You know, People should know that AI is in the loop here yeah. um, and being able, and more and more it will be. And then the second thing is issues are gonna happen. So do we understand how they manifest? You know, do we do we realize what are the kind of issues that will will crop up? And then the third aspect is how do we protect the people who are using these systems? Because it's supposed to be helping us. It's supposed to be supporting us. It's supposed to be augmenting our intelligence. So people will be in the loop. So how do we protect the people who are in that loop? And and the the issue isn't the machine. The machine isn't bad. Don't blame the machine. It's the humans who develop the system, maybe don't test it properly, and as a result, it causes problems, or use it in inappropriate ways, or it falls into the hands of, of bad actors. And there's a big debate at the moment. I was at the Bletchley Park um, AI Safety Summit. Mm -hmm. A big debate there about whether we should be open sourcing these large foundational AI models, or we should be keeping them closed, you know, in the hands of, you know, a few safe companies. And it was very interesting. A few weeks later, the whole issue at OpenAI blew up and you yeah, sort of look yeah. and think, well, is it really safe? And do I trust that company yeah. um, to look after it? Um, do we trust governments to look after it? Because do they really know enough about it? Or do we need almost like doctors, a Hippocratic oath where, um, the developers of these systems, you know, actually know more about it and and will keep us safe. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, in the way that you know the the doctor's Hippocratic oath says, you know, first do no harm. Um, so you know, I think that's a that's a, a key aspect uh, to all of this as well. Yeah, I think it is a really important point because you know around that time of the Bletchley Park, I was doing more more reading about it and reading the coming wave by Mustafa Suleiman and sort of stuff like that. And when you add up these things that have been talked about doing regulation and having more government departments and having the the red teams and all that within the, the the AI companies to be able to manage these sort of things. You start adding up all of those costs. And then if you layer on top of that, what happens when a bad actor uses AI to disrupt democracy or to create pathogens or whatever like that? The good actors, hopefully like us, have got to create those benefits in medical outcomes, improving efficiency, improving climate. We need to create those good benefits to outweigh the downsides in that here. And I generally think it's going to be on the positive side as we go forward, but we need to make sure that dynamic is working and that flywheel goes. No, I completely agree. But I, I do think that there are some areas where um, we really need to, you know, think about this, you know, so I've pointed out in the book, my Great grandfather was shot by a firing squad during the Russian Revolution. Um, you know, because he was on the wrong side. <laughs> and uh, my um grandfather on my father's side, you know, was a Quaker and was a conscientious objector um during the war. You know, he worked on um developing military systems, etc. He was an engineer, um, and so you know, became a key worker, but you know, refused to go and fight. Um, and I guess some of that sort of rubs off a little bit where you sort of look at it and you think, okay, um, conflict, you know, that turns to hot conflict is is bad. And AI in the middle of that, you know, it's clear to me that you know, AI should not be deciding to shoot um, somebody or kill somebody. Um, just like mines and other kinds of military equipment, you know, we should just say, look, we're just going to ban them. 
um, the UN should just ban them. And there have been actually debates about this going back to 2014. Um, and yet governments, even the US, you know, has stepped forward and said, well, maybe there'd be some benefits, you know, in having that. You know, we were not sure we want to, you know, sign up to a ban on it. Um, to me, that doesn't show much intelligence because in the book, what I describe is, you know, intelligence really comes down to us understanding, using information to understand our environment so we can survive and prosper as a species. That applies to us, it applies to birds, it applies to you know other animals, it applies to plants. We all use information to learn about our environment and, and use that to survive as a species and we pass it on through communication, through evolution. Um, doesn't share much intelligence we go around killing each other that yeah, obviously yeah. doesn't meet the criteria my criteria um of intelligence but what's interesting is by the same token ai it doesn't need to survive it's a tool that's helping us learn more about our world and helping us um potentially survive you know as a species mm -hmm. as well so we need to use it uh, for that purpose so, so what are the key principles that you try to get over in the book that you, you really, what are the key ideas and concepts that you think you're trying to get over in the book that we should know about now? So um, it's really, yeah, how did AI become possible? You know, semiconductors, the, the industry I've worked in my whole career, first integrated circuit came out in 1960. They have improved... 25 billion fold since then over that period of time um if your car had improved at the same rate you would now go at 200 times the speed of light um it is unbelievable these are the most complex things that humans build and they're hidden away and we know nothing about them until suddenly there's a covid pandemic and you can't buy a car because there's a bit of a shortage of, of of semiconductors and suddenly it becomes oh what are these things but they power our modern life you know you you wouldn't have gone to the moon without um semiconductors you know they they were the first major application that semiconductors um were used in or integrated circuits uh we used it and and so you know the fact that that has evolved to the level that it has, has allowed us to start having the compute power. Mm -hmm. Information is the other key piece. Um, and, you know, the way the internet has, has allowed us to have all of this digital information. There's a wonderful guy called Claude Shannon who came up with the idea of the bit, this idea that all information could be stored as a set of ones and zeros and that we could communicate um, this information. And communication is about how do you reduce the uncertainty of the receiver of the information having the same information as you are transmitting um you know so information is critical to be able to make um ai work and then the methods that are sort of following on from what we've learned about neuroscience and you know human ways of, of learning that have then been applied with this compute and this information to create ai so this is how we've made it then you know how we can use it um, and then how we can control it. And the fact if we actually sit down and learn more about it and understand some of the challenges and understand where the critical points are, then everybody can be part of the process of, of actually control using this technology and controlling it. So I've tried to write it in a way that everybody um, can understand and, and really you know, see where it is. The good news is semiconductors, you know, this massive improvement that we've seen starting to slow down. So, you know, although well, computers... What do you think, what do you think about quantum, though? Will still get better. Be? Yeah. <laughs> Again, I touch on quantum, and, you know, actually the thing I think is even more interesting is potentially in the future uh, molecular um, computing. Yeah. Um, quantum, well, first of all, does it work? Nobody's quite sure. Um, it will help in some ways, um, but it will still be a machine under our control. Yeah, yeah. Uh, molecular the same you know maybe ai will allow us to make um, molecular machines that have a completely different power envelope um yeah. and will allow us to build you know really interesting machines you know in the future but they'll still be you know controlled by a method that has been imprinted on it by humans um we will still apply it you know it's, mm. it's, it won't come alive you know i talk about consciousness and what consciousness is mm. in the book right. and yeah. the idea yeah. that you know, actually, these machines might simulate a form of consciousness. They might appear to have consciousness, 
but it is just a simulation. It's yeah. it's a that is that is us imprinting upon it, you know, some humanistic anthropomorphic um, ideas. It won't be conscious. Let's not let's not go down that route now, Nigel. I'm really looking. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to receiving and reading your book. So I can't wait when it Amazon drops it through my letterbox and that. Wonderful. Shows. So thank you so much for spending the time and sharing your insights with us. And that, that pleasure. Time. Look forward. Yeah, really to enjoyed it. it. Thank you. Cheers. Please give this interview a five star like and subscribe for future interviews. Thank you.